Mr. Bellis, to the position of Associate Justice on the District Court, I submit this nomination for your advice and consent, uh, along with uh, his fine resume. So, uh, Mr. DeCabellis, welcome. Sure. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to take a moment to introduce your family and friends here, please do. My privilege to my wife, President John Macedonio. Morning. My witnesses, the, the Honorable Joseph Harrington and Attorney Ashley McCormick. Excellent. Well, it was like the worst commute in, in 10 years here today with a couple of crashes, so I apologize for that. Um, but we're here and it's going to go well. I am uh, going to start by um, introducing your witnesses. So we first we have the Honorable Judge Joseph P. Harrington, the first Justice of the New Bedford District Court. Welcome, Your Honor. Thank you. You can stand or sit, whatever you, whatever you want to do. No, no, we, we're not going to sway you. We, we, we believe everything you say. First of all, I'd like to thank the governor's counselor for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of my friend and hopefully my future colleague, Fred D. Cabellis, who Governor Healy has nominated as an associate justice of the district court. I've had the pleasure of knowing Fred for more than 25 years. After I left the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office and began working with my dad in New Bedford, I met Fred, who was working with Attorney David George. Our offices were about 150 yards apart, off of Barrera, about a driver. Um, both my father and Attorney George were tremendous mentors to Fred and I, and they taught us how to practice law. We learned early in our careers to work hard, to treat clients, opposing lawyers, court staff, and the general public with dignity, compassion, and respect. Shortly after meeting Fred, I learned that one of the most important things to him was the practice of law. He was proud to be a lawyer, and it showed. He was always prepared, read all of the newest decisions that came out, and he enjoyed discussing strategies or ways to help his clients. Many mornings, we would run into each other on a walk from our offices to the New Bedford District Court. During these walks, it was apparent that Fred spent a lot of time preparing his cases and thinking about how to affect the clients that he had that day. He displayed all of the characteristics that one would expect from a successful lawyer, intelligence, honesty, integrity, and preparation. As a result, he developed a successful trial practice in both the district and superior courts. He was well-respected by lawyers, judges, court personnel, and anybody that was saw him in the district court or in the superior court. A couple of years ago, he became an assistant clerk magistrate in the New Bedford District Court, and I had the pleasure of representing clients at magistrate hearings that he presided over. His temperament, his ability to quickly grasp the issues, and his general legal knowledge were all evident during these hearings. I recall one hearing that involved a very difficult neighbor dispute that ended up before him. There were complaint applications against both sides and both parties were probably wrong. I think my client was probably a little less wrong than the other guy. <laughs> my perspective. Um, walking into the hearing, I didn't think there was any way that these parties could resolve the dispute and anticipated that criminal complaints would have to be issued against both neighbors. These were people who'd never been to court before and really didn't belong in the criminal justice system, but they were all stubborn. Fred spoke to both parties with the right balance of authority, compassion, empathy, and then by the end of the hearing, they all gave each other a hug and they walked out without having criminal complaints issued against them. It was the effectiveness of his um, position that really um, made that happen. In 25 years of practicing law, there are only a few clerks or judges who have been able to achieve that result, and Fred was one of them. Since becoming a judge, I've had the pleasure of working with, Cl with Fred as a clerk in my session. He treats lawyers, litigants, and other judges with dignity and respect. Those are characteristics that will serve the Commonwealth very, very well if this body confirms him. One of the remarkable traits that he has is a willingness to learn new things. When the pandemic hit, neither of us were that young, and uh, we had to deal with technology. The court system had to adapt. Zoom, we had Zoom, we had video conferencing, we had remote hearings, and a whole lot of other terms that really didn't fit into our vocabulary. Um, without trying to find one of our kids or a teenager to set up the stuff, Fred learned how to do it. He made sure 
during the pandemic, and even today as we use video conferencing, that the system runs as smoothly as possible. He's truly a team player. Since his nomination, I've had the opportunity to speak to a number of my colleagues about Fred. Each and every judge that I've spoken to about Fred has said the same thing to me, that he will be a great judge and a great addition to the district court. It's my sincere hope that this body confirms his nomination to the district court. Thank you for the time and opportunity to speak on behalf of Fred. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Judge. Any questions? Councilor Jacobs. Thank you. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you. Um, so I, I appreciate everything that you shared, um, especially the, the tail end about the COVID you know, sort of adaptability. Um, along those lines, I'm curious if you have any examples you can point to or think of where um, you can kind of share with us your perception of the nominee in terms of um, access to justice and creating uh, you know, either solutions or, or adapting in a way that enhances the access to justice in the court. In the, in the New Bedford District Court, it's a very close building. Um, we're almost on top of each other. And one of the things that I've seen him do is he makes sure uh, that everybody gets heard, everybody gets an opportunity to be heard. Um, I've seen him, um, when it's not his role to do something, he jumps into that role. He makes sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard and has access to justice. Thank you. Any other questions for the judge? Thank you. Dr. Devaney? Um, how long has it been? Just about five years. Good vote for me. I, thank you. I've, I've been following you. You've been doing good. Uh, um, I really don't have any questions for you. Um, I, I'm I would just say, um, how many cases have you observed uh, that he has been uh, present? We've had a similar practices, so we're always in the same courtroom. So I would watch when he was up before a judge. Um, we had a couple of cases together where we represented co-defendants. Um, and then I had a handful of cases before him when he was a magistrate. So I've, had, I've, I've seen him function quite a bit. Is there one case that stands out that you were so impressed with him? I think the one that I just spoke about where he was a, um, where he was the magistrate and these people couldn't get along, save their, save anything. One would say it's bright and sunny out, the other say it's raining out, and they couldn't agree on anything. And he brought them together, and at the end of the day, these were people who really shouldn't have been in the criminal justice system, and he made it happen that they didn't. Thank you. Yeah, the testimony means a lot to me. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you, Judge, and we appreciate all the good things you're doing as presiding in New Bedford. We appreciate you very much. So thank you for coming here today, and thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts of uh, the fine nominee. Appreciate thank it. You. So good one. Next, we have Attorney Ashley McCormick. Welcome. Welcome. Members of the Governor's Council. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and speak on behalf of Frederick Nicabellis, or Freddie, as we all call him. I had the privilege of working alongside Freddie for over two years when I served as a prosecutor in the Bristol County District Attorney's Office, while Freddie was a criminal defense attorney. I have also had the experience of working in, with him in my present role as a criminal defense attorney, uh, with him as an assistant clerk magistrate. Given my experiences with Freddie, I've come to know him both professionally and personally. I was honored when he asked me to attend today's hearing. On my first day at the district attorney's office in 2015, I watched Freddie try a second offense operating under the influence trial or a drunk driving case against a colleague, uh, Natasha Acevedo. Freddie's presentation of the, his case was so masterful that I still remember it over eight years later. Freddie's opening statement drew in the jury and set up a case of rushed assumptions by a rookie state group and he presented important concepts in our legal system in a unique and powerful way. I remember as he turned to his client and made the motion that his client was cloaked in the presumption of innocence as he sat before them. It was evident in his presentation of the case that Freddie knew every inch of the road that his client traveled on that evening. As he submitted pictures of the roadway, which critically showed that the traffic pattern the trooper described was inconsistent with reality. At the end of the trial, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. 
Freddie shook his client's hand and immediately extended his hand to his call to his uh, to a, a ADA Acevedo. I got up and introduced myself to him after that day. And we began our professional relationship. I identify as a woman and as a lesbian. While Massachusetts is a liberal state, the culture in the court system is far more conservative. When I started, I was one of the few openly LGBTQ plus members of the Bristol County Bar when I started. Freddie immediately, immediately made me feel welcome in the legal community, and he has been a tremendous mentor. Freddie went to law school because he wanted to help people. This motivation was cemented when he met his mentor, David George. Attorney George's reputation still precedes him even decades after his passing. By all accounts, he seems to have had the skills, compassion, and integrity of Atticus Finch. There was, a lot of off there was not a lot of office space available to a young lawyer when Freddie started, so Attorney George let him set up an office in his library and took him under his wing. Learning under Attorney George taught Freddie that you could run your practice by putting people first and everything would work out. In New Bedford, sometimes that meant being paid in scallops or a Portuguese casserole sandwich. Freddie practiced for 22 years as a lawyer specializing in criminal defense and plaintiff side personal injury. During my time at the DA's office, I worked closely with him on a variety of matters. He was always prepared, respectful, and passionate when he came to court. Most notably, we had a child assault case together uh, that was set for trial where he represented the child's mother's boyfriend. Uh, the child had some unexplained bruising and Freddie's client was in a caretaking role of the child. We litigated the case for several months. As the trial date got closer, I met with the child and his mother. Based on that meeting and evidence presented by Freddie, I had to dismiss the matter. Freddie never wavered on his, on his client's innocence while also respecting the judicial process and working cooperatively with me. I also recall re representing the Commonwealth on several motions to suppress against Freddie. During these proceedings, he was extremely thorough. His command of police witnesses on cross-examination, ability to recall the facts and applicable law, and his closing statements uh, was, impre was impressive to watch. But in my opinion, Freddie's most impressive skill is his ability to tell his client's story. Whether at a bail hearing, a plea conference, or sentencing hearing, Freddie knew how to earnestly share with the court snapshots from his client's childhood, pivotal moments in their life, their values and motivations. This comes from a place of true compassion. He wanted the court to really know someone. His client was an exotic dancer. He would be able to tell the court the path of this person's life and to evoke the empathy necessary for a just result. Freddie's effectiveness as an attorney was only bolstered by earning the trust and respect of other members of the trial court staff, including the probation officers, court officers, assistant clerk magistrates, and administrative clerks. As a defense attorney, I now appear before Freddie regularly at clerk magistrate hearings. He has seamlessly transitioned to this role. He has fostered an approachable and inclusive environment to allow everyone to tell their story. He takes care to treat litigants and attorneys with respect. He consistently uses inclusive language and makes accommodations when appropriate. I think it bears noting that during the pandemic, Freddie was a go-to clerk for his lawyers. Uh, he could do anything to help transport a client, to get them a hearing, uh, to make anything possible. This set him apart from his peers. When it was easy to hold to the status quo, Freddie still cared to strive for a higher level of service, to put the people first. In my practice, I've also had the good fortune to be hired by former clients of Freddie's. One such client was in her early 40s facing a violation of probation based on a drug screen. She had recently completed nursing school and was on the brink of turning her life around. In examining her criminal record, she previously had no convictions, uh, only a global, what we call pretrial probation resolution, which is not a conviction. She shared that Freddie's kindness and advocacy gave her the break at a critical moment in her life to turn it around and to go to nursing school, complete nursing school, and work on conviction. I've heard similar sentiments from all of Freddie's clients. It comes as no surprise to me that Freddie has applied for the judgeship, as his passion and respect for the passion of law is core to his identity. He loves the courtroom. He's often found covering as a sessions clerk just to watch a trial or a motion to suppress. He generously offers advice to new lawyers such as myself and thoughtful feedback to more seasoned lawyers who value his opinion. I can confidently say that the nomination of Freddie is consistent with the values uh, judges should have in this commonwealth. His integrity is beyond reproach and displays respect and inclusivity to all. I recommend Freddie without reservation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank Mayor, you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Councilor Kennedy. When you leave here, get on the second floor, get into the hall on the left, yes. pick up your application. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. 
much. Well, we've never met before, but your reputation is excellent, and I really appreciate the letter you wrote and you coming here today. Councilman Devaney, did you have something? Did you? Yes. Jenny McCormick, your testimony means a lot to me. Uh, your extensive knowledge of this nominee is very important to me. I've said it before, I've been with you for five years, and I've seen someone sitting here, and I've said, well, what experience have you seen in the court of this attorney? Oh, I saw him once. That doesn't do it. You did it. You knocked it out of the park. <laughs> um, now tell me, what attribute would you give to this nominee uh, that he's going to bring to the bench? I think the most salient one that comes to mind is, is his empathy. He really knows how to, he genuinely wants to learn about someone's background, mm -hmm. hear someone's story, and it's very important to him to get that right. And I think that places him in a very unique position to be a judge, to find a just result as to what's appropriate. Yeah. Thank you. Your testimony means a lot. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Oh, Council Jacob, sorry. <clears throat> Thank you for, for your testimony. I really do appreciate hearing it. And um, my question kind of follows up where you ended with inclusivity. Um, I shared many of our story, <laughs> Fred, uh, of things that I've heard have, have gone on, particularly around, uh, well, across the spectrum, honestly. But uh, what I wanted to bring to you is um, if you can speak to your perception around gender bias, if there, you know, a, a strident woman might be characterized in a way that a uh, assertive male, you know, <laughs> that kind of a that kind of a thing. Just if you have any experience of him to share around that issue. Sure, I think if I understand your question correctly, I mean, I see that a lot in his current role as assistant clerk magistrate. I think, um, you know, I'd like to believe I'm a critical, um, you know, important role as a lawyer of somebody appearing before him, but I think these hearings would go just as well, even if the parties were unrepresented. Um, I've represented women, I've represented men, I've represented transgender individuals in front of Freddie. Um, everyone gets the same level of respect, um, and he certainly works cooperatively to echo some of Judge Harrington's comments to get people on footing. I think our last hearing involved um, the separation of a lesbian couple. One was, you know, threatening a restraining order, and he got everybody to walk away very calmly, feel supported. He never talks down to individuals, um, and, and I certainly don't think gender plays any role in his um, ability to decide a matter. I appreciate that. That is very helpful, and, and honestly, your entire your entire statement was really good to me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming up. Anyone else in favor? Anyone against the nominee? All right, we're going to close that portion of the hearing. Um, uh, Councillor, um, uh, the order is for me to be first, but I'm going to yield to uh, my uh, Councillor Ionella. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, but first, we're going to hear from the nominee. We're going to let him do his statement. Sorry, I'm just, well, okay. I waited 35 minutes late for this, so I'm not in, in this. No I apologize. Well, you know, okay. the time. Okay, thank you. I'm Mr. DiCabellis, the floor is yours. Why would you make you a good, good morning to all the councillors. I'd like to begin by thanking Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll for nominating me to the district court. And Valerie McCarthy and her team, I thank you for all your hard work, dedication to this process. I would like to thank Attorney Paige Scott Reed and Attorney Darrell Kesselheim for all their assistance and their support. And to all the members of the Governor's Council, I'd like to thank you for all of your time and this opportunity to come and speak with you today. I would like to thank my wife, who is present, and our adult children, Matthew and Michaela, all those stressful situations that we find ourselves in the practice of law. We are very proud of our children. Matthew, who is 25 years old, about 18 months ago, returned from a combat deployment in Africa where he was serving in the Army National Guard. He is now pursuing a law enforcement career. Our daughter, who is 28, has blessed us with our eight-year-old grandson, David, who is an avid baseball and a basketball player. I am exceptionally proud of my wife, Melinda, while raising a family, taking care of me and putting up with the long practice hours. She went back to school and earned her bachelor's of science in nursing. She has worked in busy hospitals as a med surge nurse until she recently landed her dream job as a school nurse at the Duval Elementary School in New Bedford. To my cousin, John Macedonia, who is present, he has truly become the patriarch of our family and he is always, always there for me. To all my friends, colleagues and mentors, I owe many thanks 
They all helped me get here today. I hope my judicial application and essays shed some light on who I am, my thoughts, and my experience. I was the first person in my family household to attend college. My father, who is 86 years young and can still outwalk me on our exercise walks, is truly a self-made individual. He only had an elementary school education. At a young age, he worked on the family farm, and as he got older, he was given some land where he started a and Auto Salvage. My father always stressed and taught all of us, five siblings, to have a never quit work ethic. He would stress there is always a way to solve a problem. Concepts of respect and discipline and keeping your word were not only taught, but he was a living example of it. In his world, he and Sheikh meant everything. If you give your word on something, make sure you do it. I call that integrity. When I was about five or six years old, the state of Rhode Island took his land by eminent domain. Being the self-made individual he is, where some would give up, he started a new business. He opened up a and Auto Sales and Service Center, which included a national tire franchise. The lessons and example my father taught me served me to this very day, dealing with life's challenges and overcoming them. My mother, who is 80 years young, has instilled a complimentary set of lessons and examples. My mother is the source of my drive for public service. Growing up on a daily basis, she would lead by example the importance of compassion, open-mindedness, and that all people have something to offer. She would stress we can all learn from one another. As I entered my mid-teen years, she went back into the workforce as a community service aid officer in the local police department. She worked in the sexual assault unit. Her career is what we now call a victim advocate. I can remember her being called out at all hours of the night and early morning to counsel struggling victims. I didn't have college role models to follow when I decided to start school. I remember my mother was the first person I said I wanted to go to college and ultimately law school. Her response was I could do whatever I put my mind to and that dreams come true. She was always so supportive regardless of the challenge in front of me. The 22 plus years of private practice, actually close to 23, I was fortunate to help and represent a very diverse group of clients in a wide variety of legal matters. The focus was always hard work, dedication, and teamwork with my clients. I obtained substantial experience in criminal and civil matters, including trial work. My clients always had a voice and were always heard while being treated with courtesy and respect. I feel I had a, a well-rounded practice and developed it into a busy law office. At this point in my career, I was still working 60 to 70 plus hours a week. I had a strong desire for public service. I saw an opportunity to serve as an assistant clerk magistrate in one of the busiest district courts in the Commonwealth, New Bedford District Court. As an assistant clerk magistrate, I have presided over and ruled upon a variety of criminal and civil hearings, conducted bail and recognizance determinations to recently arrested individuals after hours, weekends, and holidays. On a daily basis, made hard decisions. As a magistrate, I was also charged with review and issuance of criminal arrest warrants, and in most cases, the review and issuance of search warrants. There is also a management component to the career. There is a supervisory role in the day-to-day -day operations of the clerk's office. There is approximately 25 members to the New Bedford District Court Clerk's Office. Assisting the public at the clerk's office counter is truly an honor. This is the first stop for many self-represented individuals seeking a variety of hearings, like restraining orders and harassment orders. The clerk's office is also a place many members of the public come for help with substance abuse and mental health issues. New Bedford District Court has specialty courts. On a rotating basis, I often serve as the session magistrate in the recovery court and the mental health court assisting judges. First, as an attorney and now as a magistrate, I have dealt with people and issues currently in society. I understand the flow of business in the district court. The position is managerial, ministerial, and quasi-judicial. What I didn't expect or foresee is I missed the law, the application of the law, the nuances, the implications, the interpretations. The favorite part of my career is the quasi-judicial role, which is about 25% of my work. I enjoy serving the public and wish to expand my service. The district court is truly the people's court, a community court. One of its strengths is access. Although there is still work to be done, in my 25 years of experience, we have made progress. Becoming the Associate Justice of the District Court is the highest calling to serve the community in the legal profession. My experience as a lawyer and now a magistrate has given me a unique perspective on what an incredible honor it is to help people through difficult times. I have interacted with people from various walks of life and socioeconomic backgrounds. Always treat each person professionally with kindness and respect. 
Everyone faces challenges and difficulties in their life, but in varying degrees. What is manageable for one person may be debilitating for another. People seeking re redress of a problem in their court are often facing educational barriers, language barriers, cultural barriers, and social barriers. An effective way to address this is having an approachable personality and a good judicial temperament. That is the hallmark of a good judge. To listen courteously, to answer wisely, to consider soberly, and to decide impartially. For me, patience is the greatest attribute to achieve opening up communication. Body language, facial expressions, tonality are all very important, but patience ties them all together. In closing, I would like to increase my public service and expand my judicial role as an Associate Justice of the District Court. If confirmed, I will continue to promote public access, access with prompt administration of justice. Everyone will have a voice. Everyone will be heard. There is a wonderful opportunity to change lives and better the community. I thank the Council for their time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Council Ayanella. Thank you very much. Let's see. One, one, two. First of all, the council has been extremely supportive. As soon as your name was suspended, he called me. Uh, he thinks the world uh, I'm very impressed with you, resident. I like someone in private practice. You've been in private practice for 20 plus years. I like that. You're in the water office, you know what it is to pay the bills, the secretary, the paralegal, because uh, that's important. Uh, and, and I appreciate that. Now, as assistant clerk magistrate, you're in the uh, public sector, the public accounts, you're doing a great job. Great to see. Uh, my poets were fantastic. I'm familiar with uh, Jack Harrington, first uh, justice of the uh, Nevada District Court. He's doing a great job. I do say once in a while uh, at the DC football games. We both uh, have the DC football games. Uh, I have one question. Sir. When I think of the Triple Crown, I think of the Kentucky Derby, the Greatness, the Belmont States. Looking at this resume, 2023 Triple Crown champion. I said, What is that? What am I missing? So, what was that? I was actually debating, Councilor, whether it was to put that up. It's, it's it, in the martial arts. Oh, uh, the, the, yeah, the governing sanctioning body is Crane Ratings International, and there's three prestigious events that usually draw the best martial arts competitors in the region. And if you take first place in each one of those three events, they crown you at the end of the season as the Triple Crown Champion. Well, that's good. If you learn something every day. It'll be, be nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no further questions. Well, you may come before the council, and I think it's going to be two weeks. You can count on this today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilor. Councilor Devaney. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Thank you for all the time. It's been really a circus for you. Um, we asked you to fill out your questionnaire at least eight days before your um eight days before your hearing and you were appointed five days before this hearing so you went back to the future but i i have to really I, i'm so pleased with this appointment and i've got to thank the governor for it because we need people with life experience you're 60 years old yes i don't want someone at 30 years you know and um Find in my 25 years, when you find someone 40 years old, they don't do pro bono. They're not out there in the community like you are. And I love your pro bono work. And that was for disabled people, um, for mentally uh, um, you know, challenged people. And I served 22 years on the Commission on Disability. So I look for that in a judge, and, and you have it. And you've done both. You had your own private practice, 10 years. And um, so you've seen both parts of it. Now, um, the thing that that I'm impressed with is your background, you know, and um, this is not a political appointment. You came in here the old fashioned way. You're qualified with experience. And um, your background, you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. And you didn't go right into law school right away. And, you know, those are the circumstances. And I can identify with you a lot. Um, my parents were Italian immigrants and they were treated terribly. And um, my dad never went further than when he was 12 years old in Italy, 
So I know, you know, that, that have come from that. And I was the first one to go to college only after having four children and my husband got along. So we don't do it the easy way, do we? But I, I'm just so impressed with your background and um, especially um, your compassion. And I've said it time and time again, I will never vote for anyone if they don't have compassion. Now, you applied um, just two years ago, and the JNC recommended you. And then the governor didn't. Tell us about that. Well, I, I had uh, my the last administration you're speaking of. Yes. I had my interview with uh, Lieutenant okay. Governor Polito and then Governor Baker. And um, I didn't coin the phrase, but I was told I was standing on the runway. They anticipated some judicial retirements and none came. And so as and that's and was the end, when they opened up that process, I think there was five months left in the administration. And then so I reapplied when Governor Healy came into office and her administration. And so what court was that that, that you would have gone to, do you know? Well, with the way they opened it up at the end of the administration, usually like this time, you're applying to some of the judgeships that are becoming available. That the last administration, because there were no vacancies, they opened it up and we put counties. So I put Bristol County and Plymouth County on the application. So um, tell me, when you look at your pro bono, is there one that will always be in your mind and it was so rewarding to help that person? And do you follow up? There is one that stands out in my mind. He was a young man that I represented in the juvenile court. We lost touch for about five or six years. Now he's a young adult. And I, I didn't know he picked up a terrible addiction problem. And I think it was someone just meant, I think it was Attorney McCormick that mentioned it to me. Um, my pay was often Chris Surler and Cotton Schmidt. It was a mostly Portuguese family in the south end of New Bedford. I also very often, but for a blink of an eye, I changed places with people. So I often use myself as an example. If I made, I can make it, you can make it. And a lot of times that, that's the motivation someone needs. Well, I mean, I don't know anyone that has had more, um, you know, more, how can I say, um, fortunate, sad, yeah, your father losing his property, and you went through a bankruptcy. So I'm saying, you know, um, we don't often have someone sitting in your chair that has had that experience. So that tells me that you have empathy for the uh, people that come before you. So um, tell me, the district court, um, while as an attorney, One, two years and so you really know it, you think they need changes and what should they be? Well, uh, it's a great question, counsel. When we think about changes to the district court, to, to make changes, I think first we have to identify what the challenges are. And I think the greatest challenge for the district court thing, I want to be upfront. I think the district court in my 29 years of experience has made great, great progress. But the challenges facing the district court is really the ability to meet the societal demands of the community that they serve. And the only way that's going to get done, regardless of what you want to change, is by teamwork with all court departments. If I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed an associate justice of the district court, I will strive to be a role model. I will treat all staff and personnel with dignity and respect. All attorneys and self-represented litigants will be treated with dignity and respect, all in accordance with the rule of law. That's the only way changes can be made, and that's how they've been made in the past. It's teamwork. It's not one individual person, and I would strive to be that role model of teamwork to get the job done. That, that's just what I want to hear. I'm sorry there's only one other counselor and I to hear that. Uh, yeah, hear your presentation because I think that's important. You've been there and, and you know the strengths and you know the weaknesses. And when we met, I said to you, you know, when I think of judges, maybe 30 years ago, they never had cases that the judges now face. And so that, you know, that, so that's really, um, it, it, it's really important to have someone like you that has represented people, you know, as a, an attorney and in the court, you've seen it all. And um, that's what amazes me because it can't be much case law when, when they talk about 
uh, you know, a gay couple and they're divorcing and, and, you know, who gets the child or whatever. There's so much more, and even into the district court too, I know that that, that has. What changes have you seen, you're 60 years old, what changes have you seen in the last decades that you've been a lawyer? As a lawyer, the biggest change I've seen is access. When I started out, it was a different legal climate. And today, the court's grown, much more accessible. Like just for instance, when I got my nomination five, five or six days ago, I was uh, very excited. The court. I was I was working a little bit later, a little bit for district court, and the probation department, with the with the blessing of the trial court, had I'm I'm going to call it a block party, and it was it was for all the community. It was a DJ, music, all types of food, all, all types of a variety of different kinds of food, families, children. There had to be I would say 75 people, maybe 100 people outside. The court departments were all well represented, and maybe some of those people have. Come to the court for a redress in the past, but I bet a lot of them haven't. It's their court. So if we can create that access, that comfort level that everyone belongs, this is their place. This is their place to resolve issues. That's what I see as some of the biggest gains and the biggest strides we've made in the district court is the access to it. There's still ways to go. We're going to get there because the more diverse the bench can get, we learn from one another, the more we're going to be able to service a diverse population needs the court. It is their court. Well, you know the thing that I find in you, and I've seen a lot of resumes, that um, you, um, you, you have seen, you know, all types of people, and uh, people in need, people who have been addicted, and, and all of that. And that's what impresses me about being on the bench, that, you know, that understanding. Um, I mean, the family dynamics has changed. Everything has changed now. And so um, you have to have someone with your age, with your life experience to bring. And, and I think that's what you, you do bring. Um, and um, you know, we talked, and, and you know the strength of the district court. You know the weaknesses. You know, um, so I don't think you would see that. And then in your private practice, in your pro bono, in your community work. And that's what I think. But, um, you know, the thing that impressed me was how your family influenced you, your mom. Absolutely. That and a lot because, um, you know, you were, brought, you were brought up to be honest and to have integrity. And, um, you know, we have a lot of racial uh, discrimination in the court. And I know you don't have any. And I look for that. I don't have a crystal ball. Sometimes someone will let us down that is on the on the you know it's on the bench and and I know you won't I'm, you know I don't have a poker face I am very happy with this appointment and um, shame on the last administration uh, I saw I saw a lot of political people jump on the line on the last the last round so I I want again thank the the governor for um, for appointing you. And um, uh, you know, I wish you all good luck. And um, like I said, we're going to have ten years. Going to be the best ten years that Massachusetts has with you, I know. Thank you, Councilor. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Devaney. Councilor Kennedy. I want to echo what uh, Councilor Ianella said about being a private practitioner and um, having really been out there on the ground. That's really important. We all know what it's like when we get judges that haven't had that experience. They just don't. Well, we all don't quite understand what it is to be out there working hard and, and paying the bills. Uh, and that's a big plus. Uh, one thing that uh, Council Ionella said is that uh, uh, Council Ferrara called you, called him right after he got the letter. He's been bothering me for two years. <laughs> I didn't give him your name for two years, so he got the letter. Uh, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very, very big fan of yours. He's a very, very big supporter. And I know. He's been telling me for a very long time that you're very deserving of this job, and I have a lot of respect for him, so I'll be voting for you next week. We have a lot of time to talk on the phone, so I don't have any questions. Thank you, Councilor Kennedy. Councilor Jacobs. Thank you. It's good to see you. <clears throat> see you again. 
I want to say thank you for coming out. We sat down, we had a really in-depth um, conversation and we covered so many areas. Um, some of the questions I was going to ask you, actually, Councillor Devaney already um, asked and I, I appreciated hearing your answer. And so, you know, I, I don't really have any questions today. Excellent. Okay. Now you get to answer my questions. Yeah. Um, I don't have any. Uh, you're an outstanding individual. Um, I, I wish you got made earlier, <laughs> but I am very thankful for the governor and her team here um, that put you forward. Um, you're a remarkable guy. When I was in New Bedford District Court the other day, everyone was elated. Everyone from the probation officer, the court officers, the judges, everyone was elated to hear your name. Um, and I don't have a crystal ball either, but I'm pretty sure you're going to do pretty well two weeks from today when we, we take a vote on you. So uh, thank you for all your service and thank you for applying and you're going to be a great judge. This hearing is concluded. Sure. Thank you.